your host for this esteemed panel. I really am passionate about cities as a motivator for positive social change, which can help create a more equitable society. So I'm excited to be here. Um, today, to provide a little background for people who aren't familiar with SPUR, SPUR is a nonprofit, member-supported organization. We promote good planning and good government through research, education, and advocacy. We put ideas and action together to make a better city and a better Bay Area region. Please raise your hand today if you are a SPUR board member or SPUR member. Thank you. Um, thank you for your support, it matters a lot. And if you didn't raise your hand, I do encourage you to join. It's a pretty nominal fee to be a member and you get access to great events like this. There's more information available for you back at the registration desk and online. And you will receive our amazing uh, publication, The Urbanist. There's some examples of it downstairs. And again, get into these events. This is The Urbanist, highly recommend. And the most recent one is about the um, visions for what the region might be. So it's a really interesting um, analysis. Um, an upcoming event uh, for SPUR is on Tuesday, September 25th at 6. It is called, How Can Emerging Mobility Technology Support Public Transit? How can new forms of private transportation, car shares, ride shares, scooters, and things that we have not yet thought of support public transit? So come here, how design and policy leaders are creating better urban mobility hubs that put transit riders first and combine transit with the growing number of mobility options in a seamless and user-friendly way. And that gets us to today's program, Polycentric Planning for Climate Change. It is co-presented by Shareable. We're very excited to be discussing how a polycentric approach, which is a bottom-up-led effort by local, participatory, multi-stakeholder groups, can be more effective at tackling climate change. I'm going to turn it over to Neil Warmflow, the co-founder of Shareable, and today's moderator who will introduce our speaker. Yeah, thank you very much, Summer, and, and welcome everyone. Uh, please do make yourself at home. If you, at any point, want to get something to eat or drink or go to the bathroom, just to the back of the room, bathrooms to the left over here. Um, uh, uh, you know, also, uh, we have our books for sale back there with our guide uh, to the book, um, kind of reframing the book, Through the Lens of the SDG, so get that. You can get a free, um, a free copy of our book at uh, sharingcities.net um, or purchase a, a, a paperback. And a little bit about, sh uh, about Shareable and our agenda today, and then we're, you know, we'll get launched and I'll do a short introduction just to frame the, uh, uh, frame the discussion. Um, and then we'll launch into the, to the, uh, the, the panel discussion and then have some Q&A. Um, so Shareable, we're a, we're a nonprofit. Our mission is to empower people to share, um, and we do that uh, through our daily coverage of the latest um, innovations that help community uh, communities share resources of all kinds. This this includes everything from the blockchain to tool libraries, open source software, time banks, cooperatives, and and movements like Sharing Cities, which we have launched at Spur um, in 2011, and now there are uh, about 50 cities around the world that have active sharing cities programs. Um, we, we also pursue our mission through our global action uh, network uh, with campaigns and convenings like today. And today's event is part of our uh, 2018 uh, program and, and it's also an official affiliate event of the uh, Global Action Climate Summit. So you know, we feel very fortunate uh, to co-host uh, today with our partner Spur um, and uh, I'm a member, I highly recommend them, look into the membership, um, just, you know, getting the magazine is worth it, actually. Um, and, and um, you know, so this is uh, our host today, um, and so thank you very much, Spur. All right, so, um, why is this topic important? Uh, to, answer, to answer that, I think we first have to recognize that the global approach to addressing climate change is, at least at this point, having limited uh, success. Um, it relies, you, you might have noticed that, um, <laughs> it relies on the cooperation of nations through international bodies like the UN, um, and some of the most powerful nations in these bodies are in deep um, and growing conflict. Um, and there is also a rise in authoritarian governments, which climate is not a you know, needless to say, not at the top of the agenda. Um, we should also recognize the, how monumental this challenge is, that, that uh, you know, this, when we 
you know, all of, all of the leading nations and others are, are trying to do is it's a kind of a first, a first attempt to govern the climate as a global commons. Um, so this is really uncharted territory for our species. There's no precedent, no blueprint. There's no guarantee of success. And given the growing conflicts between major powers and also the fragility of international cooperation in general and the uniqueness of this challenge and its enormous scale, it's, it's really no wonder that progress is kind of slow. So, you know, bottom line, we should not count alone on this, on such a, a large, slow, and I think risky project, frankly. And, and um, you know, I, I think the, you know, the odds are low that this alone will do the job. Um, so, you know, we, I think we should continue, uh, of course, because it, it, you know, could be high risk, but it, but it could also be high, you know, it's also high reward. Um, but we, you know, but there's a big but here, which is, but we'd be wise to pursue another complementary strategy alongside uh, the global approach. And I, I believe, um, and it's our position at Shareable, that we need to place much more emphasis emphasis on a polycentric approach to climate change where local commons-based bottom-up e efforts add up to significant global progress. I believe this is a, it could be at least, a sure, speedier, and more effective strategy. And we can explore why and why not in our panel discussion. Now, our inspiration for this panel, and this, this is not you know, an original idea, um, you know, it comes from um, Eleanor Ostrom and maybe others. Um, Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize in Economics for her extensive, multi-decade global field study of natural resource commons. She focused specifically on how local users democratically manage uh, community assets like forest, fisheries, grazing lands, irrigation systems, and more. And, you know, the upshot of her lot of research is Commons are, uh, are frequently a more sustainable way to manage local resources than business or government. You know, the latter all too often apply one size fits all solutions to large swaths of territory with varied cultures and, and conditions. Now, before Ostrom, um, it was widely believed that people could manage a community asset over the long term that self interest would eventually lead to overuse and ruin. Um, this was due to an influential but weakly supported uh, theory, weakly supported in my opinion, uh, put forward by Garrett Hardin in his famous 1968 essay, The Tragedy of the Commons. Who's heard of that? Okay, so um, we're, on, we're on the same page there. Um, however, Ostrom's large evidence base uh, you know, didn't just debunk Garrett Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons theory, but for us at Shareable and, and others, it really challenges some of the ugly and unexamined assumptions of our technocratic society, like that technology drives history, that people lack agency, that they're objects to be manipulated, not subjects, that big data is the new oil, you know, that artificial, artificial intelligence is God, that it will soon know better than us, uh, that democracy is slow and inefficient, people in government uh, are problems, not solutions. And the only solutions that matter are the ones that can scale. That's uh, a very popular idea here in Silicon Valley and in San Francisco. Um, in contrast, Ostrom's research and her thinking, her philosophy, offered a deeply humanistic vision of society. She showed that ordinary people have agency, they can self-manage to meet their own needs and face their own challenges, that communities uh, know their situation best and are in the best uh, position to create solutions. That human scale, uh, that the human scale, democratic nature of the commons is their secret to their success, right? And that human scale efforts replicated globally could add up quickly to big, lasting global change. So that's a big, that's a. A big claim, and one we get behind, and you know, you might be asking, does this strategy have a chance of working? So, I want to use uh, some stats from car sharing uh, to make the case that it can. Um, so, a 2010 UC Berkeley survey of North American car sharing numbers showed that 
one shared car replaced up to 13 owned cars and 51% of members joined to establish access to a car. So you can reduce consumption and increase access to an asset uh, through sharing all at this, you know, simultaneously. Um, the, the financial impact could be huge to car ownership, costs about $9,000 a year in the US, 80% of that spending goes outside of the local economy. So theoretically, if a city could, um, a city could keep $1 billion in the local economy annually if it, uh, for every 150,000 cars it takes off the road. And uh, you know, car sharing can be run as a commons. One of, the, uh, um, one of our favorites is, is um, Moto Car Sharing Cooperative in Vancouver. Um, the Better Business Bureau, uh, it's been around for 20 years, very successful, the Better Business Bureau gives it an A plus rating. What do you think the rating is for Zipcar? Anyone want to guess? It's kind of a leading question, so it's, 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 this is a softball. No, it's an F. They give an F, right? And, and you know, the reason is simple: is that is that uh, um, you know, the, in the co-op uh, model, the the users are the owners, and they're incented, you know, to bring the cars back, you know, clean with gas on time, right? And and it's a car that's not the case. Um, so you know, the, in my mind, this is a very unique approach and strategy. I don't really know of anything else that can you know, simultaneously decrease consumption, increase access to resources, and grow the, uh, the local economy. That, that's the, the magic of sharing. And, and now imagine if most of our urban economies around the world ran this way, if energy, housing, finance, public space, food, and more were run on a commons basis or a, through a sharing model. You know, the, the potential for us is clear is that, at Shareable, is that we could address several of the sustainable, sustainable development goals at once and, um, and also address climate change uh, and, and potentially do it quickly because we'd be harness, harnessing the energy of you know, billions of city dwellers. We've got you know, half of the planet's population now lives in a city. So, you know, this, this vision might intrigue you. I understand if it sounds a tad, tad fantastical. And that's exactly why we did our book, is to you know, pull together uh, case studies and model policies from around the world. It's, it's 270 pages, 75 pages of them. And, and uh, you know, it, it suggests that all the pieces of this world already exist. It just needs to be built on. And, and you know, in fact, our book is just a tiny sample of commons-based solutions from all over the world. That these solutions, you know, they, they exist in virtually every sector of society. There, there are 800 million members of cooperatives around the world, just as a, to give you a, 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 a feeling for the scale. And, um, you know, and some are really impressive in their scope, like the ecosystem of co-ops in the Emilia Romana region of Italy. You know, they make up 30% of the local economy. It really, you know, kind of uh, undergirds their middle class and, and stabilizes their middle class there. And some are, you know, very modest, you know, like the local tool library, you know, Berkeley has a, has a, um, a tool library, and Oakland has a tool library. Um, you know, but most people don't know about these solutions, and if they do, they don't appreciate their value individually, they don't see them as, you know, part of a large global tapestry of solutions, that is a big movement, you know, thus there's little mind share for this a kind of commons-based, polycentric approach to climate change, you know, and our world, you know, desperately needs this approach um, we need this parallel, complementary strategy that you know really hasn't fully arrived yet, um, and you know that's the point of this panel is to help change that. You know, in short, to borrow a famous line, you know we're we're here, at least I am, and Cheryl is to recruit you, and we we couldn't have a, a better panel for this purpose. Um, in Laura, uh, we have a sustainable uh, sustainability. Uh, Policy expert you know, from Spur, and our co-host today we have uh, we have Mary Bell, um, an environmental justice lawyer, a groundbreaking one I hear, um, that can help us think about how everyone can participate and benefit in the strategy. In Saki, we have a commons activist and scholar, um, and in Gill we have one of the pioneers in the sustainability movement and the chief sustainability op um, officer of Palo Alto. And to start off our discussion, you know, each each panelist will you know talk just one minute about themselves and the work and how it relates to our topic today. 
And um, so, Laura, let's, let's start with you. You've got one more. Okay, yeah. thank you, Neil. Can everyone hear me? I think we are. We're doing the mics. Oh, we're doing the mics. Okay, mics. There's a mic for each table. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Neil and Shareable, for putting on this panel. And Summer gave a wonderful introduction of what SPUR is and does. So if you're unfamiliar with SPUR, now you're introduced. We're introduced. We do a lot of uh, programs like this, and what I've been working on for the last decade at SPUR relates to how cities manage and react to natural resource challenges, so water, energy, climate change, dealing with the impacts of climate change, trying to manage habitat in cities through green infrastructure, um, and earthquake resilience, so quite a few different things, hazards and, uh, and, and resources, and how do we see those things as an opportunity to make cities better, as there are more people moving to cities, um, more people moving to the Bay Area, how do we make the Bay Area a model of urban sustainability that can be uh, scaled up or replicated uh, in other places? Um, and so we uh, are uh, really excited for this discussion today, and I'll just leave it at that, but if you have any questions about SPUR's work or what SPUR does, um, feel free to ask me afterwards or during the Q&A. Oh, I should add that in addition to doing programs like this, we do a lot of research and we do a lot of advocacy. So the, I talked about the subject matter, but we do a lot of research reports, we bring together blue ribbon panels, we host workshops on uh, topics. We have a couple coming up on a new project we're working on related to the future of the Bay Area, so check that out on our website if you're interested in contributing. There's one gonna be one here, one in Oakland, and one in San Jose in the next six weeks or so. And uh, we do advocacy related to the research that we do to try to enact the future that we've worked with others to figure out uh, we'll make our cities better. So I'll stop there and hand it over. Didn't reach that very good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so good afternoon. My name is Maribel Nzebu, and uh, for over a decade, I've worked hand in hand with overburdened communities across California and the United States, you know, that are seeking to prevent further environmental and corporate harms to their communities. And as an environmental justice lawyer, I've been working at the intersection of environmental and civil rights law, challenging violations under environmental law, but also the disproportionate impacts on low income and minority communities under civil rights law, and working to shed light on the significant gaps in environmental pr protections that we have today. Um, later. Hi, hi everyone. Um, my name is Saki Bailey, and um, I'm coming from the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, which is kind of a faraway place from the United States. Um, I went to law school in the US, and then ended up being for five years the executive director of a research institute in Northern Italy, um, dedicated to the work of Eleanor Ostrom in the Commons. Um, after that, uh, I started working for the University of Gothenburg as part of a research group on the topic of social sustainability. And the reason why uh, we call it social sustainability is because we think that environmental issues, issues of environmental sustainability cannot be separated mm -hmm. from issues of social process mm -hmm. and um, creating a, a governance structures which encourage uh, both uh, sustainable use of resources but also participatory governance of resources. That, the, that our belief is that the more decommodified access people have to uh, fundamental resources like food, water, housing, education, healthcare, et cetera, the, the better, more decommodified access we have to those, thi to those things, the more sustainable our uh, use and production of those resources will be as well. Um, so that's, that's basically our view. And um, in, in talking about the work of Eleanor Ostrom, um, I want two, two points, which I think was a wonderful framing, Neil, but just two points I wanna add to that is that um, her work, I think, really showed us that uh, people, when they're given the right options, are able to make the right choices. And rather than um, assuming a kind of uh, self-accumulating or self-maximizing human nature, as most of neoclassical economics does, and the, and the paper by Derek Hardin, um, which very much depended on this model of this idea that humans, by nature, are greedy 
and uh, regardless of what kind of options we have, we will, we will choose always to be the rational self-maximizing actor. And she shows empirically through um, hundreds of cases that in fact this is just not true, that people given the right options will make the right choices. So what does that mean? That means that we actually need to utilize systems of incentives and disincentives. And what is that? It's law, it's regulation, um, it's creating incentives through taxes, it's creating also bottom-up through communities, choices by which we can govern our resources more directly. But here in the, uh, in, in the US in the last year, I've been working specifically on housing at the Sustainable Economies Law Center, a really wonderful place if you guys don't know about it in Oakland. Um, and at the Sustainable Economies Law Center, they're approaching law from the point of view of citizens. So not just regulation in the sense of legislatures and um, national and federal law, but actually using law for in a transactional sense at the level of sort of communities coming together, building better um, firm uh, cooperative structures which allow for the governance of uh, things like, oh, the slide's not up, uh, but, but housing, for example. We don't really think about housing when we think about climate change, but it's actually an extremely important issue. So some 84% of our energy, uh, of our uh, greenhouse um, emissions comes from the energy sector, right? And from that energy sector, about 29% of that is electricity. And of that 29%, over 70% of it is residential and commercial use of, <laughs> of electricity. That's a lot of electricity that we actually can decide about how, how to use and how to limit. Um, furthermore, um, in the energy sector, 84%, again, of all uh, global greenhouse emissions, 60% um, in the United States, which is the 25th, we use 25% 25, uh, 25 of those greenhouse emissions are the, created by the United States. So we're the largest greenhouse uh, gas emitter, as we all know. And of that, 70% of our energy use actually comes from buildings, building operations and building materials and the transportation to bring building materials to uh, where those buildings are, are happening. That's a huge impact. So in fact, by participating in urban and city development of housing, deciding right now and here how all of this construction is taking place in San Francisco and in Oakland, because we're really in the midst right now of a massive construction boom, um, in, re in reply, obviously, to the massive shortage of housing. We have real choices ahead of us, and my research in, in, in Europe um, has been able to collect a lot of very interesting cases where we meet the highest standards. In, in Europe, um, there's been 25,000 uh, uh, buildings constructed under the passive house standard, which is the highest environmental standard in terms of reducing energy consumption, higher than the LEAVE standard that we have in the United States. In the United States, only 1,500 buildings have been built in that passive house standard. Um, there's a lot we can do in terms of demanding from our city governments that they implement these standards as mandatories, not optionals, because LEAVE, LEAVE certification is not mandatory by any means. Um, so this is, this is where my research has been and, and I think there's a lot of promise in bottom-up uh, participatory governance of our resources. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Gil Friend. I'm uh, really delighted to be here because uh, in part because Share will and Spur are two of my favorite organizations so it's a lot to participate in. We're actually working with Spur on a project I'll talk a bit more about later. Um, um, these are topics I've had a long interest in. I was co-founder of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance 40 some odd years ago, which still works to this day on uh, ecologically sound and economically democratic urban development across the United States. Um, uh, have, uh, for most of my adult career, been working as an advisor to companies to try to build these ideas into the operations of companies, large and small, and we're developing some investment strategies on that in the future. Uh, but for the last five years, I've been uh, CSO, Chief Sustainability Officer for the City of Palo Alto, uh, an unusual community, heart of Silicon Valley, of course, as that was known, 66,000 residents, uh, but a daytime population of 154,000. Uh, massive influx of commuters uh, every day. And so you know, your stats about the contribution of buildings to the energy mix is true nationally. Uh, in California, and particularly in Palo Alto, it's much more skewed to transportation. 
Uh, we've done a lot on building efficiency. Uh, very strict requirements, actually more strict requirements in the state of California, which was the strictest in the United States. Uh, and that leaves us with more than 70% of our emissions coming from road transportation, mostly commuters. It's a very different mix in different, uh, in, in different jurisdictions. Um, and one of the things that's been, um, um, let me just say something by way of background on the context that Neil spoke about first, and then we'll get more about Palo Alto. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're living in a, in, in a story that's very young about how economies work. Uh, and some of the problems that you talked about are problems not of the commons, but problems of the commons within financialized capitalism, which is just a few, a few centuries old. Uh, and the notion that we hear about all the time is the focus of business is to maximize return to shareholders, you know, privileging capital and privileging the short term. That's barely 40 years old. That became the law, the, you know, the kind of conceptual law with Milton Friedman in the 1970s who said that's the purpose of companies. And before that, people had a much more diverse notion of what the purpose of companies was. Certainly, you have to pay your shareholders for the use of their capital, like you have to pay PG&E for the use of their electricity. But no one would think that the purpose of business is to pay the light bill. Yet we somehow think that the purpose of business is to pay the capital bill, when in fact the purpose of business is to do what the business is there to do. Uh, and so the notion of purpose-driven enterprise is, is one of the things we're seeing rising uh, more and, and more in the world. So you know, so we got that problem. We've also got the problem that the tools that we use lie. Uh, and you talked about the need for incentives. I think equally we need a need to remove the distortions in the market, to remove the subsidies to the bad that proliferate throughout the market. The, you know, the, the total global subsidies to the coal industry exceed the market value of the industry. So you don't need to be a captain of industry to understand the problem there. You can ask any person on the street, what do you do if you have an asset that is costing you more to maintain every year than it's worth? You know, everybody knows that you get rid of it. You sell it off, you take the loss, you move on. We'll see that happen with the fossil fuel industry and a number of other industries where the assets are going to be stranded uh, by the effects of the, of the coming years. So, um, um, you know, one of the things that Silicon Valley is known for is, is innovation at scale. In fact, if you go to a, a venture capital company with an idea, the first question they're going to ask you, or maybe the second question they're going to ask you is, will it scale? Meaning, will it look like that? Will it be a billion dollar company in no time? And we have the opportunity here to discuss a different kind of scale, which I think of as the, as the that, that's vertical scale, yet big fast. And I think there's something else that I call the horizontal scale of the federated small which is how do we do small, local, appropriate place enterprises that are knitted together through networks and networks and networks and internets and blockchains and so forth that enable clusters of relatively small enterprises uh, to act, act, get the economies of scale and the effective impact in the marketplace uh, as the large ones. And I'll, I'll close by saying that um, you know, somebody who went into government service five years ago uh, with enthusiastic commitments to everything that we're talking about here, I gotta tell you, democracy is a tough game. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard. It's hard to do participation. It's hard to move timely when you need to involve people. So there's a tension between speed and participation. Uh, there's a real challenge that I'm very aware of since I'm, my focus is very much about innovation. Uh, I'm in a community that on the one hand is innovative, but people people tend to clamor for what they already know. Yeah. People want the familiar. And so how does the change process and disruptive innovation happen in a democratic conversation? Uh, I'm sometimes jealous of my colleagues in China who are moving at light speed on what they call an ecological civilization. That's part of the national strategy of China. You don't hear that much here. Uh, but m you know, massive commitments to renewable energy, uh, shareable transportation, reforestation, and so forth but through the convenient mechanism of an authoritarian society that can just make decisions and make things happen. We can't do that. And I said I'm a little jealous. I'm not very jealous. I don't want that. I don't want that trade-off. But I'm curious to know how do we get the focus on the speed in a democracy and in a, in a local democracy for that matter, which is our focus here today. So I'll stop there. Great. Thanks, everyone. That was a wonderful, um, wonderful introductions. And yeah, let's dive in. and. and I thought we'd, uh, uh, we'd, we'd start out to just kind of taking stock uh, of things and, and um, 
And I'd like to hear from each of you, like, to what extent is this approach being pursued already? Like, what's already there? Briefly, we've got, uh, in, in Palo Alto, there's very extensive uh, citizen participation. There are formal committees and commissions um, that have an advisory function to the city council, but there are also more ad hoc issue-based bodies. So, for example, we just completed the, uh, a 15-year general plan, comprehensive plan for the city that has 40 people meeting every two weeks for two years. Wow. You know, working through this you know, monster document line by line looking at overall issue strategies and nuts and bolts and down to word by word editing. Um, it's, uh, it's a process that tries people's patience um, um, and, it, and, and one that really challenges this question of where do you want to go. And so for example, in, as we talked about transportation, the prior plan um, had in it, uh, as is common in many cities, minimum parking requirements as an entitlement condition of doing a development. If you're gonna build a building, you gotta provide X number of parking spaces per desk or per apartment. Um, and, um, and when the conversation started, nobody, it seemed, had ever encountered Lyft and Uber, much less Lime and Bike Share and so forth. And so, you know, and there's congestion and there's inadequate parking. So people said, we need more parking. Uh, by the end of the process, we didn't quite get to parking maximums, which would have been nice, which Helsinki and other cities are doing, but we did get to something softer that said adequate parking periodically reevaluated as to need. But kind of that's the process, that's, you know, the camel's a horse designed by committee, right? So that was kind of the best we could get to. Um, on, the, on the green building uh, matter, which uh, Dr. talked about, We've got a technical advisory committee uh, that includes residents, uh, developers, architects, engineers, city, city staff, and so forth. It's so looking at what, what will we demand, local governments regulate uh, building codes in California. So what will we demand of the new buildings that are being built and the retrofits that are being done? And what we've done is promulgate a, what's called an energy reach code that's 15% more demanding than the energy codes of the state of California, which like I said before, is the toughest uh, in the country. Um, and so there you have both uh, 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 enthusiasm, enthusiasm and commitment and the practical constraints of folks who work in the field every day say, I can't really do that right now. Um, the challenge of building a trajectory that says, how can we agree together to stretch what you're able to do in the direction that we think the puck is going? Um, and it's, you know, it's tough because people have very different points of views, different experience, very different sense of the possible. For me, one of the challenges has been, um, one of my, one of my uh, department director colleagues said to me my first few months there, said, um, Bill, how can, we, how can we create goals if we don't know exactly how we're gonna reach them? <laughs> I, I, was, I was fascinated, because like, you know, that, that, that embodied the completely different worldviews that we had about the nature of change. For me, you set goals that you don't know how to reach and you figure out how to get there and you invent new technologies and processes to do that and that's interesting to me. To her, it was daunting and terrifying. Uh, and you have both of those perspectives in any group, in any community. You have to find ways to build a bridge, or I would say build a story between them. Because part of what we're doing here is inventing a new story that we tell ourselves about what the world is that we live in and how we want to be. Wow, it's a huge question, you know, what is there that's already out there that's working is the way I hear the question. Um, you know, I think it's important to dream and imagine, a, you know, another world that's possible. Absolutely, we have to change the entire paradigm of how we think about the economy, the way we access resources, the way in which we treat the environment in view of how we treat those resources. Um, I think that, you know, from my experience, the things that I find that are working in Europe, uh, which I, in, in some ways, um, I think is much more ahead um, in meeting environmental standards, unfortunately, than the US. Um, in, in, in Europe, I've found some very interesting examples. For example, in Germany, uh, which is a leader in, in, in Europe, uh, in, in, green, in, in lowering greenhouse emissions and also in coming up with green policies, um, that through their green bank and through their green party, which is actually a very strong party in the, in the German context, um, they've been able to fund uh, projects in housing uh, that meet the passive house standard. 
So, and also cut the cost to the consumer by 40%. So this is incredible. Um, it is, and how is this being done? Well, it's actually being done by the consumers themselves. So not the construction industry. So um, the project that I'm talking about, it's called Bao Lupin. Um, and it's actually something which has been highlighted quite often on Shareable, so if you're interested in finding information <coughs> about that, it's, it's, it's there as well. Um, and Bao Group, it literally means build group. Mm -hmm. And it's um, consumers that are coming together that got tired of the sort of ha shortage of housing, the affordable housing crisis, which is taking place all over um, major metropolises all over the world, including in Berlin. Um, and in Berlin, citizens came together uh, and together with really cutting edge environmental uh, architectural firms and came up with um, passive house standard buildings which have now proliferated all over Berlin. There's 500 um, bow open projects in Berlin. Um, some of this of course comes from the sort of uh, specificity of Berlin having a lot of access to land something which is going to be a huge challenge, for example, in a place like the Bay Area. But this model is not only uh, attractive for the consumer, which I think we need to think about that. We actually need to think about solutions which are not just pleading to the moral conscience of individuals, but rather also in their interest from an economic point of view. And the fact that these houses are 40% uh, cost 40% less than regular market rate housing makes it an easy choice for people. Um, and these houses are incredibly beautiful, and that's also another way in which to go beyond the sort of pleading to the moral conscience of the individual, is to inspire them through beauty. Um, these houses are uh, incredibly uh, beautiful with, with gardens on the balconies, you know, you sort of, I guess you've seen pictures of these sort of like, where there's basically forests growing outside of the, of the houses themselves. So they're very much, um, you know, sort of blending into the, cre creating a sort of natural landscape. Um, and, and on top of it, they're also reconfiguring the way in which people live communally. So many of these homes are intentional communities that think about things like creating communal and shared spaces, which also uh, create more wealth in the sense of that people, with less space, people can do more. So they create workspaces, communal kitchens, uh, communal gardens where people can you know, have their kids play and everybody can sort of watch them from their balconies so they create also a sense of community. Um, so I think it's through things like this, inspiring <coughs> beauty, um, not pleading to the moral conscience, but to the actual economic interests of, of actors that we can, we can build a new society. So <coughs> from an EJ perspective, there are two types of community-based solutions. One is collective and community participation in our existing democratic process. And as you mentioned, yes, it might slow things down, but I think that we might have to shift some of our values around uh, speed because inclusivity is not always a speedy thing, especially when we're learning perspectives that are not encapsulated in the mainstream uh, discussion. Um, and so deep collaboration with overburdened communities on decisions that will affect their environment um, is necessary. And we're seeing that kind of shift being applied to environmental regulation making and enforcement, land use laws, planning and siting decisions all here in, in California. Um, so one uh, example of, of a planning scenario in California is AB uh, 617 that was passed a couple years ago, and it requires air quality management districts in the state who usually come up with air quality plans, you know, on their own inside their ivory towers. They now have to come down and work with community groups to conceptualize and build a plan. And <clears throat> in the West Oakland example, we're seeing a move beyond the, in, the typical silos. We're not gonna continue looking at things on a pollutant by pollutant, facility by facility basis. Instead, we're gonna try to address things like land use authority that cities have by bringing them to the table to plan. And, um, <laughs> you know, one of the, 
reasons why the grassroots ex uh, experiences are so violent for us are that they illuminate the structural problems that we cannot see. Uh, when we hear their experiences, it, it helps us understand. For example, I mentioned the pollutant by pollutant approach to environmental regulation. Well, for so many times, for so for so long, uh, environmental justice communities have been pleading with the state of California. We are dealing not just with one facility, but with multiple facilities in our neighborhood. We're, we're getting negative impacts from multiple places, and it's not just the sum of all those impacts, but the cumulative impacts of all of those together. And so what happened in the state of California is we began to develop what's called the Cal Enviro Screen. And that's taking a step toward looking at and measuring cumulative impacts. But we wouldn't have had that frame if it were not for the involvement of the disadvantaged communities continuously bringing forward that frame to the environmental and land use decision making. Um, so that involvement, deep involvement, deep community involvement <coughs> is also necessary because as Gil mentioned, each community has different needs, different impacts, and there are no one size fits all solutions. Um, so it's really important for us to continue to build on ways to share power through participatory democracy. But I think there's another level that doesn't involve the government. And this is where communities can liberate themselves as we've been talking through local abundance, through creating and sharing uh, resources to interrupt reliance on peak oil and external in interests. And some of the examples of solutions like this that have been bubbling up from EJ communities include embracing green technology, rainwater catch and share uh, store, sorry, uh, gray water reuse, solar, uh, and also this sharing economy. We're seeing community resources networks uh, in, in response to the need for resilience. Um, one of the deepest needs in a community is to know where the resources are. And in some uh, overburdened and under-resourced communities, your neighbors might be the resources. And so getting the communities out to, to understand what's already in their, network, uh, in their neighborhood and to begin to build networks that can help them prepare for disaster. And we're also seeing plant exchanges and community gardens to address food deserts. Um, and one of the most uh, sort of innovative solutions is the community energy co-op, where communities are coming together to collectively own local renewable uh, and regenerative power systems. So, you know, one of the big problems is that if you live in multifamily housing, you can't always access solar, solar or other renewable energy. Uh, so the communities are coming together to pool their resources and to have local co-ownership of, of regenerative and renewable power systems. Uh, so I would just quickly add to that that this need to empower disadvantaged communities, you know, it's from the ground up, they are taking the power into their own hands. But I would also say that externally we have a responsibility to infuse resources into these communities to sustain their participation in the democratic process. And to, for us to share our skills through workshops, training, partnerships, fundraising, grants, uh, access to jobs and other workforce development as a way to continue to empower these communities to participate in the democratic process and hopefully that participation will incrementally perhaps, but perhaps, uh, you know, just dr drastically impact the decisions that we make. Uh, so that's great. Yeah, yeah, I'll add something Tracy now really uh, nicely said. I, I want to point, I want to build on what you said, Mary Bell, as well as what Gil said about how um, the democratic process, we, we experience a tension between 
uh, speed and um, inclusion and engagement and participation. And I want to err on the side of, I think we think too, um, the business the business world makes us think too much about speed as a, as a necessary uh, piece of success. And I think that's not the, speed is not the purpose of democracy. The purpose of democracy is to do the right thing and get it right, and that involves participation. And so I think we need to be more patient with the time that it takes to actually um, do make changes in the world because things have sticking power. You build a new, let's say a wastewater treatment plant or something, that thing's gonna be around for 80 years. You wanna make sure that you don't put it in a place that is harmful, that is going to be at risk of sea level rise or other things. You wanna make sure you take the time to do the analysis and, and work to put it in the right place. So um, I think we have to think of time as uh, a little less linear in some ways when we want to build infrastructure and take action on climate change and other things. Um, I, I totally understand that there's a frustration there with the, with the uh, not being able to do things as quickly, especially when we are called by climate change to act quickly, to get things taken care of before, um, to slow down the rate of emissions before we can't ad adapt anymore. But um, I think we also have to be uh, focused on our process as being as inclusive as possible. I also just wanted to your earlier question, Neil, I wanted to, uh, respond to the question of are we succeeding with this decentralized approach and focusing on climate change specifically? I think we are succeeding be because of that. If we didn't have a decentralized approach, we wouldn't have a Paris Agreement. We wouldn't have, cities are the laboratories of where we try to figure out policy and change and it's the sharing and socialization of the ideas that cities come up with and the process that creates those policies and institutes them and institutionalizes them that is the thing that is en enabling us to have a response to climate change in the first place. And so uh, I think yesterday we had a, a C40, which is some of the world's biggest cities doing something about climate change. And there are so many different mayors and cities and organizations within cities who are deeply committed to working together to share ideas around what we do about climate change. And cities, which are very quickly growing more than half the world's population lives in cities, as you said, um, our, our uh, seventy percent of the world's emissions come from cities. So if we are able to get uh, to take action in cities and share the very best practices and continue to innovate and implement those best practices, that's really our best shot at um, at uh, dealing with climate change, both on the emissions front and the transportation front. And finally, one one last thing I just wanted to say, which is that I think a decentralized approach is actually <coughs> essential because by having it, um, having different ideas coming from different places, being tried in different places, failing in different places, we have the chance to learn from each other and there is not a single thing, it, it cannot be dismantled by any one political administration or by any one particular set of um, ideas at a certain time. We, we have created something that is durable. It can't be broken quickly and I think that's really important too. So I will pass it back to you. Yeah, I just want to touch on um, on uh, something Maribel said that that, uh, that that you know two strategies: there's local government as part of this kind of decentralized uh, approach. There's local government, but then we're also the commons, just people getting together to meet their own needs. Um, and and uh, you know I, I like this tension that's kind of building here between the commons and, and government and be between speed and democracy. Um, and I just want to provide a, just a little, a little perspective. You know, in our book, we talk about three realms of value creation, uh, you know, the market, government, um, and the commons, and I think they all ha have a different relationship to time. Democracy is slow process with a long-term horizon. Um, in a market, it's all short-term. Um, and in a commons, it's short-term and long-term, that people often organize to meet their needs you know, their immediate needs, you know, food, water, housing, right? Um, and, but they uh, often also, though, are thinking long-term, like how do we protect this commons and pass it down for future generations? Um, and, you know, in, in also in that process of, of working together, building that civic capacity and social capital, they're, they're really building what I think is the most important renewable resource there is, which is our cooperative capacity as a species, right? Um, 
that when you build that in a community, it can last for generations, for centuries. Um, and uh, you know, and just to bring this to a question back uh, to the panel, uh, to think about you know how how uh, people in communities, how government, the commons, and, and the market, how can how can they work together? Like how can this? Um, what are some concrete examples or strategies that you've thought of that you know these things could work together when they when they have different modes, different values, different time scales? speed and participation. I'm not arguing for speed over participation. I'm saying they're both there. We need to honor them both. Uh, it's a creative tension, not a political tension, although it can be, but it's a creative tension that says, how do you invent new ways of doing things that, that attend to seemingly contradictory commitments? But if you can do that, that's where innovation happens. You know, there's this, there's this old um, kind of management metaphor of business of uh, um, um, you know, speed, quality, and price pick two. You know, you get to optimize two at the expense of the third. And that's kind of a standard way that people have thought about business for decades. I see nodding heads of recognition in the audience. Innovation shifts the frame and says, let's take all three of those things and put them into a different context where we can do all three of them better. That's called innovation. And everybody else is struggling trying to figure out the two out of the three, and you're doing the three, and you take markets or you take elections or what have you. Uh, so there's the challenge. And I'm reminded of, um, a, a, a old African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together, right? Because well, none of us is as smart as all of us. And that's the big value and the opportunity in participation. Um, um, Neil, to your question, my friend uh, Bill Reed, uh, one of the founders of the LEED framework, in fact, the architecture framework, who thinks of himself as a lapsed architect now. He doesn't build buildings, but he works with communities. And he typically works with large uh, communities who are uh, in, 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 in conflict, in battle, or in the verge of battle with each other, about to lawyer up and you know, fight each other for years and lose friendships and cost a lot of money and so forth. And what he does is um, works with people at the level of um, aspiration. What do you really care about? And he finds that when he, he asks people that, people will say very different things and stake out very different positions. And he'll ask, what's the reason, what's the concern behind the concern? So he kind of peels the layers of the onion. And sometimes it takes days or weeks to work through uh, an entire community around that. But he finds that eventually, just about everywhere he's done this, he gets to people but <coughs> with very common concerns. They'll express differently their ideas of what's possible might be different, their political interpretations might be different, but what they want in their lives and in their community and their lives or their children are usually very, very similar. And that's the beginning of the work. Once that's done, then they start thinking about design. They won't do design until they get to that common resolution. So to your point, Laura, about you know, sometimes it takes time. Yeah, that might take time. Once that's done, everything moves very differently and very quickly. So the typical short-term mindset that says, we don't have the time to think about that. We don't have the time to talk to all these people. Well, no, it's an investment in a capacity for speed and wisdom that doesn't come about any other way. Can, can I build on what you just said, which is with respect to climate change again, I feel that, maybe we could, be interesting to hear others of you disagree, but it seems as though we have a social norm around that now. That social capital has been built. Climate change is here and everybody knows it. It's not a question anybody. Well, all the people who are, have the power to do something about it. Um, and uh, we've, we've, we've done the hard work of socializing the idea, I think. Everybody is aware of it. And the question now is how can we move? I think we are at a poised to move quickly and some of the things that you talked about earlier with respect to setting goals um, and some of the things we've all talked about with respect to sharing resources um, about how to reach those goals are starting to, to leapfrog. I mean, the Jerry Brown just set a goal of having a carbon neutral state by 2045. Talk about setting a goal but not knowing how to get there. That's a, uh, a, it's a huge achievement for California and I, 
huge opportunity for innovation. Uh, London Green, our mayor in San Francisco, just announced that all buildings by 20, I think it's 2030, are going to have to be, new buildings are going to have to be carbon neutral and 100% electric so we can start to cut off natural gas, which is the fossil fuel we still use here. Um, and so setting goals like that allow uh, for, it, it's sort of a, a beacon too for others to learn from. Um, and I think now that we have so many cities, so many non-state actors, so many regions all committed to caring about climate change, recognizing the impacts are here and that we have to do something about it, I think we sort of tipped What's that phrase, tipping? The tipping point, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> There's a, been a tipping point and now the, um, the real work can accelerate. Yeah, so we're getting uh, close to the, where I want to open up Q&A. Um, uh, so I want to ask about a little bit more forward thinking, forward facing question. Um, you know, what, what do you see as the biggest barriers or, or obstacles uh, to collective action polycentric governance and solving climate change or approaching climate change? Who wants to bite that off first? Saki? Yeah, so um, I'm gonna connect this a little bit with my thoughts that I was building in the last question as well um, about the role of government, the commons, and the market, right? Um, so we think about the commons as a kind of third way between the market, and what does that mean? Um, well, it means that, um, it, it, it can mean that it's about activation of citizens, um, but it can also mean that it's about creating non-market spaces. Um, and really, I don't think that we need to create a, you know, sort of a, a war between these three areas. Um, in Sweden, uh, you know, these three areas are understood as offering different tools in a toolkit. Right? So we need government because we need regulation. We need to create um, disincentives, like as, as, as Gil was pointing out, um, for corporations to behave in the way that they do with profit as the bottom line rather than other kinds of human values and the environment, um, as, which is the topic of today. Um, we can also, through regulation, uh, create incentives for uh, solar panels and different kinds of switching over to renewable energy policies, um, creating a, a better housing uh, communities that are using materials that are meeting the standards of environmental standards. Um, and then really, um, when we talk about the commons, um, we're talking about spaces that have been created largely by government in some ways um, to allow people to, uh, uh, to utilize the resources in, in community uh, participatory bottom-up ways. Um, so like in the bow group, an example that I gave you, um, without the concerted effort between the municipality of Berlin, the Green uh, uh, Bank of Germany, um, it would have been impossible to create these communities. Um, although there were certainly experiments in them before, so not necessarily do the innovations have to come from government or the market. Um, the, the innovation came from the community, but without the support from the loans that were provided by the Green Bank, without the uh, sort of support that was given by the municipality of Berlin and, and this, this organization, this statewide organization called Stadtbau, um, that gives support to these housing communities to just, you know, decide the long-term process of doing a construction project, et cetera, um, and, and give the sort of technical and legal and financial advice about all of these things, it would have been impossible. So I think what we need to do is we need to think about how these three things aren't things, but tools. In a toolkit of cre creating better, um, more humane, more equitable, and more sustainable policies, um, yeah. So some of the you know pitfalls and dangers and difficulties in sort of a polycentric approach I think are really rooted in the social problems of our country and 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 needing to work in multicultural ways and across divides and you know reach out and include people who don't look like you or act like you. Um, it's hard. And not only that, but different resources um, are needed for different communities. They each have different needs. 
And if we take uh, the Native American communities, uh, they, they, they care deeply about mercury and fish and the salmon run. And some other communities don't care about those types of issues. So building a network that's based on difference but sameness <laughs> is part of the is part of the challenge. And um, in terms of su successful examples of uh, participatory planning, I turn uh, to the state's climate change initiatives. Um, and one of the recent programs is called the Transformative Climate Communities Program. And here is where the state is providing grants to local communities to engage in these polycentric planning processes that it, it create a structure that's not government-based, but it's based in the community coming together with government, with business, to create this plan for the future of their community. Uh, and so that's one of the models that we're seeing that is working, and you know, we haven't seen all of the results of these plans yet, but it is a step that we are taking in the right direction towards funding more polycentric forms of planning for the future. And more inclusive, I would add, too, which yes. makes them more durable and better and yes. more worth sharing and more worth replicating. That's all I'm going to add to that question. <laughs> you know, I, I hear a lot of people in their frustration with current political conversation in the United States say, we, we really need to talk to other people who are not like us. Uh, which is a good first step, but actually we need to really listen to other people who are not like us. Because if you know, if my, if I go in and if I go into a into a diverse conversation with my agenda to try to get my point of view done and across and adopted, my ears are plugged from the beginning, and I'm gonna not you know I'm gonna miss the opportunity for community, but also the opportunity to learn and to hear the kind of ideas and innovation that can come out of this diverse conversation. So I think we really need to be very open to that, to, you know, to a, a humility uh, in recognizing that good ideas can come from anywhere, and certainly sensitivity to conditions and needs and so forth that come differently from different places. But there's another challenge, I come back to the question of time, but in a different way, which is how do we get diverse enough participation in these polycentric conversations? Because, you know, it's tough. If you got a wife and a job, or maybe two jobs, maybe a family to take care of, um, you know, I think about the Palo Alto City Council meetings. There's a small number of people who are there at almost every meeting, mm -hmm. and there's some other people who come out issue by issue, but it's always a tiny, tiny fraction of the community. And think about it. You know, who's got time to go spend hours at a city council meeting? Mm -hmm. So, um, and you know, extend that. Uh, it's not just a matter of education and financial condition, but circumstances of life. And so if we, if we want something that's truly polycentric, we need to innovate in the polycentric process too. How do we make it possible for more people to participate? Maybe digital democracy is a part of that, but that's got its own issues. Maybe there's other ways, uh, but you know, often what we think about as a participatory process is, you know, is a fraction of a fraction of a percent of the community. Now, maybe that's representative, maybe not. It's certainly not as wise as the larger conversation. So somewhere between, you know, less than half of us voting every couple of years to all of us being in a town meeting together every year like we used to do in New England, somewhere in between that is a zone of innovation that we really need to give some attention to. Yeah, and I, I, I think one of the barriers, just to add to that, is, is um, you know, a kind of shriveled or shriveled drunken like civic imagination, right? That we have ghettoized civic participation to this like, you know, one day every four year after work experience um, and have not made physical or temporal or economic space to be a democracy, right? And, and um, you know, if you kind of flip the the script, what if we spent as much time earning money, as much time engaged in democratic processes as we do in doing business and earning money in the marketplace? Um, why, why don't we have, uh, why don't we have a civic festival for every election that lasts for weeks where people build platforms and vote and celebrate and, have a, and make it a civic drama 
that draws people in. Um, you know, these this is not even a new idea. You know, I mean, this is how some democracies in the past actually worked, right? So, um, so I think there's a kind of cultural barrier, but that's also a, that, and I wanted to turn it to uh, to the levers. What are the strategic levers that we can pull? I want to point one out and then ask you, you guys. We'll talk some about them, so this could be quick. But, but what are the strategic levers that we are investigating through a new podcast called The Response, which we're gonna release in just a few weeks. The first episode is natural disasters themselves. That often communities you know, emerge uh, to, um, to respond and recover that are very bottom up, self-organized, uh, and, and you know, for, uh, for instance, Hurricane Sandy in New York, there was something like 60,000 volunteers that worked for months um, in, New, in New York City and the Rockaways and other places. That's our first episode is about what happened in the Rockaways, right? So, so those are opportunities where the social order is kind of wiped, literally wiped off the map and then can be, be rebuilt um, almost from scratch. So that's a strategic level. Anyone want to add to that? And then we're gonna go to q I would just love to think about there being other levers than a natural disaster. I mean, that seems like a, a terrible thing to wish on anyone in terms of a way of bringing community together. I think we've tried in the Bay Area recently to be more proactive about anticipating potential disasters that we could, that we might have and plan ahead so that we can try to create that community building and a sense of uh, change and making change possible um, in an inclusive way before there's a disaster, and I'll just give you one example. Many of you may be familiar with this project we were involved with, maybe some of you were involved with, I know some of you were involved with, called Resilient by Design, and it was an effort to bring design teams together with communities in different parts of the Bay Area to anticipate a future of sea level rise, earthquakes, and other sort of hazardous or social stresses, and try to think about the power of design to bring people together to proactively be, become more resilient so that we could be prepared for something and not have to suffer so badly in order for there to be that conversation taking place. So that's one cool thing that I think we should try more of, but I'd be eager for, to learn others. I briefly mentioned <clears throat> the precautionary principle earlier, and it's one that's been largely adopted in Europe and it has essentially four <coughs> pillars to take preventive action in the face of uncertainty. So not waiting until we know whether it is harmful or not, but if it has the capacity to be harmful, we'll take preventive action. Uh, second of all, we're gonna shift the burden of proof to the proponent of the activity. <laughs> the business actor will prove to us that it, their action is not harmful. Uh, a, the third pillar is just exploring a wider range of alternatives in our decision-making processes, and the fourth is increasing public participation in decision-making. I just I think that this type of framing, if incorporated into more of our uh, government and business decisions, has the opportunity to shift the balance of power towards the environment and really bring people together. Um, so I, I, I just think it's a principle that we should, um, I don't know, we should uh, advocate for in more circumstances here in, in this country. Anyone else on this? Yeah, we have a question more of a general scale. Yeah, so um, I think the greatest strategic lever that we could uh, manipulate towards creating more participatory democracy and more participatory processes. So this is really what I hear. It's about how are we going to create more time for citizens? Because time is really what it's about. Um, you know, in, in Europe, where people have more de decommodified access to the basics, people have more time, okay? When, when mothers have subsidized childcare, that gives them more time. When workers have uh, healthcare and, and benefits when they're sick, they have more time. Um, time is really everything. It's really the greatest resource that a human being has and we treat it like nothing. 
Um, we, we have to invert this uh, relationship. And what does that mean? It means that we need to create more decommodified access to these kinds of fundamental resources. We need to name them and we need to create better, better access to them that doesn't involve the market, so non-market mediated access to the basics. And through that, people will participate. In Europe, people participate more in political processes. Um, a really great example of um, people participating in government um, at a very community level is in Bologna. In Bologna, the city of Bologna in Italy, they have created what, the right, what they call the right to a city or, or a common city. And what did they do? What does this mean? That means that they have divided the city of Bologna into smaller blocks and given each set of, uh, each community a decision-making power over how budget the budget is spent. There's an initiative going on right now, the Community Democracy Project in Oakland, for creating an Oakland public bank. Now, this is crucial because without financing, nothing happens, okay? And so the project that I was talking about, for example, Baugruppen, the reason why it took off was because of green public financing, of green bank financing. Um, so part of participation has to also involve the, that we first attack the, the, re, the, the resource which is the greatest resource in our society, which is money. We need to actually spend time to create public participatory um, financial institutions and then use those financial institutions as strategic levers for catalyzing decommodified access to the things that we care about. Yeah. 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 Um, I want to come back to that, but first I want to talk about dis preparedness in general and disaster preparedness, because Laura mentioned uh, well, there's a long tradition of you know, civil defense and communities organized around being prepared for things to happen, um, um, you know, volunteer fire departments and all the rest. In Palo Alto, we have two aspects of that, one, one disaster focus, one opportunity focus. Uh, we have community emergency response teams who are trained by our emergency Office of Emergency Services to be available to, you know, like the 60,000 in New York, to muster up if there's a flood or an earthquake, trained, equipped, communications in place, so that when the disaster happens, you don't have to all of a sudden figure out what to do. You already have a plan in place. This is something I long for for the Bay Area, where we know we will be hit by a large earthquake someday, and. I don't want to start the participatory process the next day trying to figure out how to rebuild. I'd like to have rebuild, you know, three or five rebuild plans in place so that when it happens, the mayor can convene people the next day and say, okay, which of these three plans is appropriate given what has happened? So disaster preparedness is compelling and obvious. The flip side of that is that we've launched a pilot project of green teams working with the Empowerment Institute out of New York where we bring together neighbors on a block by block basis. We've now done this with 25 blocks. And on each block, you know, five or 10 households come together, meet <coughs> weekly and work together on greening their lives. So we'll work together on weatherization, new water heaters, car sharing, community gardens, not as an individual family activity, but as a neighborhood activity at block scale. And the notion of the pilot is let's try this at 25 blocks and if it works, let's grow it out to maybe 25% of the blocks in the city, focused on the upside opportunity, not just the downside risk. Thank you. Um,